Welcome to Introduction to Sampling. Statistical inference is a process of using data from a sample to gain information about a population. Since we rarely have data on the entire population, a key question is how to use the information in a sample to make reliable statements about the population. The population of interest is determined by what we want to know. It is important to know what population we are interested in generalizing to and what variables we will collect and how they will be measured before taking a sample. Our sample is often limited by what is practical because of limitations such as the cost of taking the sample. The design of a sample is the method used to choose the sample. Some types of sampling designs. One type is a voluntary response sample. In a voluntary response sample, people choose themselves to be in the sample by responding to some general appeal for sample participants. For example, if we posted an advertisement in the edition asking Germantown Academy students to respond to some particular question. One problem with this type of sampling design is that people with strong opinions, often strong negative opinions, tend to reply, so they are overrepresented in our sample. Another type of sampling design is a convenient sample. In a convenient sample, individuals who are easiest to reach are chosen for the sample. For example, we use students in, in this class as our sample. One problem with a convenient sample design is that this group may not be diverse enough to accurately represent all students at GA. Let's look at a sample from history. Here the headline says, Dewey defeats Tr Truman. The day after the 1948 presidential election, the Chicago Tribune ran the headline, Dewey defeats Truman. As we all know, Harry S. Truman defeated Thomas E. Dewey to become the 33rd president of the United States. The newspaper went to press before all the results had come in and the headline was based partly on the results of a large telephone poll, which showed Dewey sweeping Truman. Some questions for you to think about. What is the population of interest? In other words, what population did the pollsters think they were sampling from? In this case, the population would be all American voters. What was the actual sample? In this case, the sample was people who participated in the telephone poll. What did the pollsters want to infer about the population based on the sample? The pollsters wanted to estimate the percentage of all voting Americans who would vote for each of the candidates in the 1948 presidential election. Why do you think the telephone poll yielded such inaccurate results? In 1948, people with telephones were not representative of all American voters. They tended to be wealthier and prefer Dewey. Thus, they were overrepresented in, in our sample. Sampling bias. Sampling bias occurs when the method of selecting a sample causes the sample to differ from the population in some relevant way. If sampling bias exists, then we cannot trust generalizations from the sample to the population. Think back to the telephone poll conducted after the 1948 presidential election that declared Dewey the winner of the presidential election. So the design of a study is biased if it systematically favors certain outcomes, that is it over or under represents certain segments of our population of interest. Let's talk about bias and sampling methods. Obtaining a complete list of our population, which is called the sampling frame, isn't always easy. And if we're not able to do this, it can result in under coverage of certain parts of our population. We've already talked about the problems with a convenience sample and those with voluntary response. Sometimes we think we're rep sampling from our population of interest, yet the population we're sampling from and the population that we want to talk about aren't one and the same. Suppose we were interested in understanding something about high school students in Pennsylvania. And suppose we only sampled high school students from private or independent schools. These students may not be representative in the aspect that we're measuring of all students in Pennsylvania. Selection bias is a systematic tendency on the part of the sampling procedure to exclude or include a certain type of unit. For instance, if we do a telephone survey, people without telephones would be systematically left out of our sample. Non-response bias is when an individual is selected for a survey but doesn't respond. How often have you had a telemarketer call your home in the evening and you either did not pick up the phone or just said that you weren't interested in responding to their questions? Uh, if the non-responders differ in some way from the responders, then bias 
will occur in our sample. Response bias is a distortion that can arise because of the wording of a question, may point um, your answers in a certain direction, or the behavior of the interview. Viewer. Maybe the interviewer um, is of a certain ethnic group and is asking questions about that ethnic group and the person answering feels a bit uncomfortable and responds in ways that they wouldn't normally. This can also cause response bias. Selection bias and World War II bombers. During World War II, British military personnel noticed that some parts of planes were hit by enemy fire more often than other parts. They analyzed the bullet holes in the returning planes and launched a program to have these areas reinforced so that they could withstand enemy fire better. The resulting armor was added to bombers in the areas that had received the most damage, but it had made no difference in the number of planes lost. What happened? This course of action may seem natural enough, but it also contains a fun fundamental error. It is called selection bias. The Royal Air Force Academy asked Abraham Wald, a statistician, to help decide where armor should be added in the UK case bombers. The RAF gave Wald information about which parts of its planes were typically hit. Wald's response was simple, brilliant, and surprising. Armor the spots that hadn't been hit by German fire. Why? This seems backward at first, but Wald realized his data came from bombers that survived. That is, the British were only able to analyze the bombers that returned to England those that were shot down over enemy territory were not part of their sample. These bombers' wounds showed where they could afford to be hit. Said another way, the undamaged areas on the survivors showed where the lost planes must have been hit because the planes hit in those areas did not return from their missions. Walt assumed that the bullets were fired randomly, that no one could accurately aim for a particular part of the bomber. Instead, they aimed in the general direction of the plane and sometimes got lucky. So, for example, if Wald saw that more bombers in his sample had bullet holes in the middle of the wings, he did not conclude that Nazis liked to aim for the middle of the wings. He assumed that there must have been about as many bombers with bullet holes in every other part of the plane, but that those with holes elsewhere were not part of his sample because they had been shot down. The bombers' wounds showed where they could afford to be hit. The undamaged areas on the survivors showed where the planes lost must have been hit, because the planes hit in those areas did not return from their missions. This is what we call selection bias. We only see a selection of the outcomes and therefore draw false conclusions. Let's look at another example from history, the 1970 draft lottery. On December 1, 1969, the Selective Service System of the U.S. conducted two lotteries to determine the order of call to military service in the Vietnam War for men born between 1944 and 1950. This draft occurred during a period of conscription controlled by the president from just before World War II to 1973. So here's the method they used for selecting the eligible men to be drafted. The days of the year, including February 29th, were represented by the numbers 1 through 366. They were written on slips of paper. The slips were paste, placed in separate plastic capsules that were mixed in a shoebox and then dumped into a deep glass jar. January's capsules were dumped in first, followed by February, and so on until December. Capsules were drawn from the jar one at a time. The picture shows Representative Alexander Pierney, a Republican from New York, drawing the first number. The first number drawn was 258, which corresponded to se September 14th, so all registrants with that birthday were assigned lottery number one. The second number drawn corresponded to April 24th, and so forth. All men of draft age, those born between 44 and 1950, who shared a birth date would be called to serve at once. The first 195 birthdates drawn were later called to serve in the order they were drawn. The last of these was September 10th. People soon noticed that the draft numbers were not distributed uniformly over the year. Record that the capsules for January were placed in a shoebox and then dumped into the large glass cylinder, followed by February all the way through till December. Given the height of the glass with respect to the length of Representative Pierney's arm, it doesn't appear possible that he could have properly mixed the capsules. The graph displays the mean draft number by month. The x-axis represents the month with the person was born, with 1 equal to January, 2 equal to February, up to 12 equals December. And the y-axis is the average draft number for that month. Notice the relationship between the month born and the average draft number. Those men eligible for the draft born in the earlier months of the year, January, February, etc., tended to have higher draft numbers, 
and thus will be called up later to serve than those born in the later year, months of the year, October, November, December. How did the non-randomness of the draft affect the casualties, the deaths during the Vietnam War? This was recently studied by Paul Summers, who wrote an article in Chance Magazine called The Writing on the Wall. Summers examined the names of the casualties on the Vietnam Memorial, together with other sources, and found the number of casualties by birth month. This graph displays the total monthly deaths by mean draft number. Men born in the later months of the year, October, November, December, were more likely to have died than those born in the earlier months of the year. Let's look at one more example of sampling bias. In 2002, Ryder Carter was being charged on gun charges in federal court in Miami. Because he had a previous felony conviction, he was facing a severe sentence. His lawyer got him a new trial by arguing that he was denied the right to a trial by his peers. Carter is black, and his lawyer argued that Hispanics were overrepresented in the jury pool. The standard procedure for selecting jurors involves working alphabetically through the list of potential jurors. For Carter's jury pool, 21 of the 38 potential names in the jury pool started with the letter G, and 14 of those were Hispanic. To make his point, Marcus's lawyers showed that just five surnames, Garcia, Gomez, Gonzalez, Guerra, and Gutierrez, accounted for more than half of the Miami residential listings under the letter G. Hopefully these examples have convinced you that a representative sample is essential for drawing valid inference to the population that you're interested in. Random sampling avoids sampling bias. So, how do we obtain a representative sample? Sampling designs. A simple random sample, or SRS, gives every possible sample of a given size from the population the same chance to be chosen. Choose an SRS by labeling the members of the population you're interested in. You can use numbers, slips of paper, or other methods, and then randomly choose from the numbers or slips of paper to obtain your sample. If you're asked to explain your sampling design, how you obtained your simple random sample, you need to illustrate how the numbers or labels relate to the individuals in the population. In other words, when you randomly choose a number or slip of paper, you need to explain how you know which person or the thing, thing in the population it represents. A stratified random sample divides the population into strata, that is groups of individuals that are similar in some way that might affect their response. Then you choose a separate random sample from each stratum. You choose the strata based on facts known before the sample is taken. For example, in a pre-election poll, a population of election districts might be divided into urban, suburban, and rural strata. If the individuals in each stratum are less varied than the population as a whole, a stratified random sample can produce better information about the population than a simple random sample of the same size. We'll see that in the former Brown activity. Cluster samples. To take a cluster sample, first divide the population into smaller groups. Ideally, these clusters should mirror the characteristics of the population. Then choose a simple random sample of the clusters. All individuals in the chosen cluster are included in the sample. An example of this, since students are randomly assigned to a house at GA, if Mr. Shahas wanted information on students' opinions regarding a proposal, he could randomly select two houses and a minute administer the survey to all students in the chosen houses. Cluster samples are often used for practical reasons, as the school survey example. They don't offer the statistical advantage of better information about the population that stratified random samples do. That's because the clusters are chosen for convenience, so they may have as much variability as the population itself. Some differences between strata and clusters. We want each stratum to contain similar individuals and for there to be large differences between the strata. For a cluster sample, we'd like each cluster to look just like the population, but on a smaller scale. To recap, the goal of sampling is to learn something about a very large group of individuals, for example, American registered voters, by studying a portion of that group. Sampling works. If you don't believe it, the next time your doctor orders a blood test, tell him or her a sample just won't do and to take all of your blood.